Hallelujah. And uh, God's good to us. Amen. Amen. And we just keep getting uh, reports about harvest. We got another report tonight. Uh, God's just doing miracles in people's life. This time uh, where family's concerned. And uh, so <laughs> I'm telling you, God's doing some wonderful things. Amen. Amen. And uh, before we get in the offering, I just want to remind you, of course, Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday, now we won't have service. Uh, of course, that's Christmas. Uh, and uh, now if Christmas would have fell on a Sunday, we would have had service uh, simply because that tends to be a very well attended service. But uh, in the morning, but being a, uh, it's an evening service, we're going to go ahead and, and forego service. But of course, we'll be here the next Sunday. We'll be here this Sunday. So praise God. Uh, we have our new product, Exercise in Our Authority, 21 CDs. Amen. Amen. Now, they have a few of these made up. Uh, they've been working diligently today. Next week, the flash drive will be in. So there will be 21, C 21 messages on the flash drive. Uh, but I'll be glad to give this to the first person that wants to. Okay, right here. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Praise God. Hallelujah. God's good. Amen. Well, let's receive the Lord's tithe in your offering tonight. And uh, uh, maybe you didn't hear me. Let's receive the Lord's tithe in your offering tonight. Amen. Let's go to Proverbs 6. And I want to look at something because uh, now we're going to continue to look at uh, the principle of seed time and harvest. But I, I want you to see something that is so important. And uh, um, you, you, you may have heard some things along this line, and, and I want to say, first of all, I'm certainly not uh, against anybody that would minister this, but uh, so very often uh, we overlook principles in the Word of God. We hear, we hear different things. People hear things, and uh, they just tend to run with it. And, and what I want to look at just for the next few minutes, eight or nine minutes or so, is, is this concept of making the devil now bring back what here's what is said what he stole except when you begin to look at scripture there's really not any backing for that and what that does is it is it is it causes people to move away from the main source and the main way that God meets the need all right amen so Proverbs 6, and we will start in verse 30. It says, Men do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. So he's hungry, and uh, maybe he doesn't have, he doesn't have a job, whatever it is, but he steals because he's hungry. Notice, but if he be found... He shall restore sevenfold. He will give all the substance of his house. Amen. Now, but you got to keep it in context. This is not someone who's just randomly stealing. He's starving. He's hungry. He doesn't have a way to meet the need other than to steal. Now, it's not right because it says here, notice, that he'll have to restore sevenfold. He'll give all the substance of his house. But here's what you'll hear ministered very often. Well, we have found the thief, and we're demanding that he restore sevenfold. All of his substance has to come to us. Well, the problem with that is that's not the context. All right? The context is a man committing adultery with another man's wife. Because notice what it says in verse uh, 32. But whoso commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that doeth it destroys his own soul. A wounded dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, a husband. Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content though you give many gifts. So he's saying in the context this, is that adultery is stealing another man's wife. And he says, if you do that, it doesn't matter how much you offer the husband, he's not going to take it. Amen. Right? 
So the context is, if a man steals because he's hungry, people will forgive that, even though they'll make him pay it back. Right? But it says, if this person does this, no way out of it. All right? They're not going to accept a gift. The, the context is not, any thief that you find, and people will say, well, the devil is a thief. He steals, he kills, and he destroys. That's right. That's his, that's his nature. But this is not saying that when you locate the devil, that he's got to bring back seven times what he stole. As a matter of fact, especially in the New Testament, you won't find that at all. Let's look at Job 42. Now, far from just seemingly disagreeing with someone, I'm not doing that. I'm, I, I, I want to show you how people can, can get off center, get off focus. Because, listen, early in my ministry, I, I preached it. Oh, I preached it hard. Tell the shout to the devil, put it back. But, you know, I mean, I kept reading the scripture and, and sometimes God upends your theology. And sometimes that's a good thing. Amen? But notice, Job 42, this is another scripture that very often people will quote. Verse 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. People say, well, the devil's going to have to pay it back just like he had to, Job, he had to give it all back to Job. I except, the Bible says, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, who stole this from Job? The devil, right? But who gave it all back? Double the Lord. Why? Because Scripture cannot contradict itself. And Scripture says in the book of James, every good and every perfect gift comes from above. You, you understand? If we say it this way, if we say that God does not have any cash money in heaven to drop on you because it would be counterfeit, then how can we say the devil can bring cash money back? Isn't he a spirit being? Now, I'm not saying that he hasn't robbed, but, but listen, what is Malachi 3 for? Malachi chapter 3. Remember what it says? When you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven, and pour out a blessing upon you that there's not room enough to receive, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. That word devourer is eater, the seed eater. So a tither has built in protection against thievery. Right? Amen. He's not going to devour that. Now, the reason I'm even going through this is this gets people's mind off the way that God does things. Amen. Look at verse 12 of the same chapter, 42. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Now, we should shout about that, really, because Job was already the richest man in the east in the beginning. Thirteen months before this, he was the richest man in the east. And the Bible says that the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And, and verse 10 says he gave him double. So he was the richest man in the east already. Now he's double the richest man in the east. But who did that? Who blessed him? The Lord. In Zechariah, you remember in Zechariah, I believe it's around chapter 9, God said this, he said, return to the hold you prisoners of hope. And he said, because I'm going to restore unto you double. And then he said, yes, I say again, I'm going to restore unto you double. So it's God that restores double or triple or however much it comes back to you. Amen. Amen. It's, it's not to say that the devil doesn't try to steal from people and doesn't steal from people. It's to say that to tell the devil to bring something back is a misrepresentation of Scripture. Amen. Now, go to Galatians 6. We're, we'll hurry. Now, 
I'm going to be very plain with you and say, now, if, if, if you believe contrary to that, that's up to you. It's, it's not the difference between heaven and hell. But the point is, is the Lord told uh, my pastor something years ago. The Lord gave him a revelation on ownership, ownership and authority. And he started teaching on it, and he said, when I started teaching on that, I could tell people wasn't ready for it. Because the Lord said something to him. The Lord said this to him. He said, he said, it's not about chasing the devil and make him give back. It's taking the ownership and the authority that you've been given in the earth. Amen. It's not about chasing the devil, trying to make him bring something back. In, uh, in Galatians 6, let's start in verse 5. Every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that's taught in the word communicate or give unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now, why is that important? That seed, that seed that's being sown. And then it says, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. One translation says, a man's harvest in life depends entirely on what he sows. Entirely upon what he sows. All right? So God's preordained, foreordained way of getting anything into our life is through the avenue of seed time and harvest. Amen. Amen. There, there's a natural law of seed time and harvest, and we've talked about that. All right? You sow a seed, it's just, it's, in, it's the law. You're, the harvest is going to come up. Well, for every natural law, there's a parent law in the spirit, a daddy law. That causes that natural law to work. And it works the same way the natural law works. Because it's the daddy law. That's the law of seed time and harvest. God instituted that law in the very beginning. Notice what he says. You'll sow whatever you, you'll, 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 what you sow is what you'll reap. Amen. He that sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now, very often that's quoted in the context of living right or living wrong, but don't take it out of its context. It's talking about financial giving. And it says the person that sows into natural temporal things will reap corruptible harvest. But the person that sows into the things of the Spirit will reap eternal things in their finances. It won't be corrupted. All right? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall. No stronger language in the entirety of the Bible than the word shall. It's covenantal language. It literally means this. It is impossible for what I'm saying not to happen. Don't be weary in well-doing. What well-doing? Sowing seed. In the morning, sow your seed. In the evening, don't withhold your hand because you don't know which one's going to prosper, Ecclesiastes says. You keep your seed in the ground because in six months you could reap a harvest off a of seed you sowed today. You could be reaping a harvest this month off of something you sowed last January. Because, because each seed has a different germination time. Hallelujah. I, I know the, the, the people that I talked to tonight about this family restoration. I, I know they've sowed seed towards that. I know they've put seed in the ground for that to come to pass. And it's coming to pass. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If we faint not. We'll reap if we faint not. There's, there's always a qualifier in seed time and harvest. 2 Corinthians 9, what's the qualifier? Give not grudgingly or of necessity, but be cheerful. Well, why would you be cheerful in your giving? Because you know you're going to be receiving. Right? Think about that. Now, I'm, I'm almost done, but think about that. If, if you need to think this way, then you think this way. But just think about another person for a moment. How would their life change if they really started believing that they could not fail to receive a harvest when they sowed a seed? Can't fail to receive a harvest. It's impossible. My life changed when I figured out if the Bible says God cannot lie, 
And it says right here, in due season, I shall reap if I don't faint. That settles the issue. Right? He says then, and he says this, because of this, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all, especially of them that are of the household of faith. So since this law of seed time and harvest cannot fail, just do good all the time. Just sow seed all the time. Why? Because you'll reap a harvest. We're pressing in to living better off of our harvest than we do off our salary. Because checks don't multiply. Seed multiplies. Amen? Now, I said all that I said tonight just to say, listen, the, if the enemy, the enemy delights in people chasing him, because when they're chasing him, they're not paying attention to what God said. The Bible never tells us to chase the enemy. It says to stand our ground against the enemy. It says to take the shield of faith and stand your ground. Right? Have done all to stand, stand. Amen. Jesus said, do business. Occupy until I come. Amen. When, I'll finish with this. When uh, you read in, in the Old Testament about David's mighty men, and it mentions one man named Shama, S-H-A-M-M-A-H. And uh, I believe Shama means Jehovah is here. But the Bible says that what Shama was protecting was a patch of lentils. And every year at harvest time, the Philistines came to take that harvest. And he decided one day, that's enough's enough. And the Bible says he stood in that patch of lentils and smoked Philistines till his hand claved to his sword. And the Lord wrought a great victory that day. The Lord wrought a great victory. If you're determined to stay in a harvest mindset, it doesn't matter what enemy comes your way. You're a tither. You're a giver. The Lord will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And I promise you, the Lord will wrought a great victory in your finances. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Whew. I could just preach on that for another hour. Amen. Glory to God. Well, there should be an envelope there in the seat back in front of you. And uh, we are just so excited about everything God's doing. Uh, paying things off. He paid off our AV account. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, I got a, uh, yeah, hey, there it is. Paid in full. Doesn't that look good? Just looks extra good. Paid in full. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lord, thank you for that. And, and I told you about the pastor that texted me and their taxes were miraculously paid. Paid on December 5th, but they didn't pay them. Well, you know, they're still paid. It wasn't a mistake. The computer didn't make a mistake. They, their taxes got paid. Amen. Now, people say, well, how'd that happen? I don't know, but I know the axe head swam too. Because people say it's impossible. That doesn't happen. Well, the axe head swam though. Amen. That's impossible. Glory be to God. So you ought to just say, I'm next. I'm next. Say, I'm next. Yes, I'm next. Amen. Yes, oh, glory. I was going to tell you another story, but I only got two minutes. Praise God. If you're ready to sow tonight, why don't you hold your seed up to the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. You know, the Bible calls him the Lord of the harvest. And I know in his perfect context, he was talking about the harvest of souls, but he's also called the Lord of Seboeth, the God of angel armies. Amen. And uh, uh, God is going to protect the seed you're sowing. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight as your under shepherd in this house. Father, I thank you for the sowers. I thank you for the givers. Lord, I thank you for those that are here tonight, Lord, that desire to sow. You said in your word in the book of Isaiah and then again in 2 Corinthians 9 that you give seed to the sower. Father, I thank you if there's those that desire to sow but they have nothing to sow that you give them seed to sow. And Father, I thank you those that are putting their seed in the ground tonight, 
that they will doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing their harvest with them because you have guaranteed it. And we receive that and we truly believe what you said through the Apostle Paul that it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And we receive that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It is so good to see everybody tonight. I just love coming to church here. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When I go away, I just want to get back. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And especially when there's six to eight inches of snow falling up north, I was really ready to get back. Amen. I'm spoiled. Amen. I, I think I saw one little bit of snow last year, and I was standing in Kroger, and there was an older gentleman in front of me, and he was complaining about the blizzard going on outside. I learned a long time ago, I'm, you know, I don't correct my elders, but I want to say, brother, that's a little snow shower. <laughs> Amen. But thank God, God knows what He's doing. Amen. And uh, uh, He put us here high and dry. So praise God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. John chapter 15, we want to continue with this that we've been on, the love life. Hallelujah. And uh, the Lord said to me, the growth of any church body will be dependent upon their desire and ability to walk in love. And we've been asking the question, what kind of power would be made manifest in a church body if everybody was just determined to walk in love with each other? Now, again, I'm certainly not saying that we're not or that you're not, but I am saying what the Word says. And you'll hear me say this probably several times through this message tonight. I'm not saying that any of the things that we're preaching, that you're not doing those or that you're doing some of them. I'm saying this is what the Word says about believers in general. All right? And in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 9, he said, As the Father has loved me, so have I, lo so have I loved you. Continue in my love. And we made the comment that the Woos Bible says, Remain in the sphere of my love. And so that's up to me. It's up to me if I remain in the sphere of that love. My nature is love because my nature has been changed into the nature of God. But I still have to choose to walk in that nature. At any time, I can lay down that nature and live after the flesh. All right? Why? Because I am a miracle in that I'm a free moral agent and I can do whatever I want. Amen. But... Just because I can do wrong also means I can just as readily do good if, if, I, if I choose to. So love is not just a choice. It's my nature, but it's a choice I have to make. Amen. And then verse uh, 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Well, how did he love us? Well, he loved us to the end, number one. Uh, he loved us with no strings attached. He loved us and gave all. So he says, that's how you're to love one another. And then in verse 17, he says, these things I command you again, that you love one another. So Jesus is saying, my desire, my commandment, what I'm leaving you with is that you love one another. All right? Matter of fact, look at your neighbor and just tell him, I love you. Uh, see, there, there you go. Amen. Now, in uh, Ephesians 4, 32, Ephesians 4, 32, it's been our second foundation scripture. Remember, Ephesians 4, 32 says, And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Even as, meaning just like. Or in the same manner that God, because of Christ, forgave you. Tenderhearted, again, is, can be trans, or kind can be translated sweet or gracious. So what if everybody's just determined to be sweet to each other? Determined to be gracious to each other, full of grace, right? Be kind, tenderhearted, meaning sympathetic or pitiful, full of pity, all right? If I'm full of pity, I'm full of compassion. 
All right, because, because one of the main components of mercy and compassion is pity. To have pity on a person. All right? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And then he said, uh, forgiving one another. And that word forgiving comes from the Greek word charis, meaning grace. So it means freely, graciously, no strings attached, immediate. Brother, I need you to forgive me. Done. Yeah, but you don't know what all I did. Doesn't matter. I am forgiving. You see that? Now, what hinders a lot of people from functioning in that level of, of love is, well, what if they do it again? Love doesn't think that way. Love expects them to be different. And we talked about that, I think, in the second message, maybe the first one. Love forgives and then expects that person to change. Well, what if they don't? Well, the Bible says that love suffers long and is kind while it's doing it. So that means that while you're waiting on that person to change, you're walking in love and being kind, being sweet. Amen. I'm glad somebody waited on me to change. Somebody kept praying for me and believing for me. Aren't you glad? Somebody loved me enough to keep me in the sphere of love. Amen. Then Hebrews 13, 1. And the very first line of Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1, it just makes a very simple statement. It says, let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. Now, I thought it was interesting in such a deep, theologically profound book as Hebrews, there's such a simple statement. And the last chapter of the book of Hebrews is all about submission, all about uh, the order in the church, all about submitting to those that have the rule over you. And it starts off with saying, let brotherly love continue. One translation, the Passion Translation says, no matter what, make, make room in your heart to love every believer. No matter what. The Amplified Bible says, make it a fixed practice. Never let it fail. To have brotherly love. Make it a fixed practice. So that means that's something that's just fixed in me. It's just what I do. Right? That's my practice. Remember the Williams translation of Ephesians 4.32? says you must practice being kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. To be good at any one thing, practice is involved. Amen. Amen. And, and remember, practice is not something that you try. You're practicing at something because you want to become proficient at it. Right? There, there are people that played ball in school and they haven't played for 25 years and they think they can just go do it again. Well, well you might know how it's supposed to be done, but you haven't practiced. So chances are it won't be as pretty as it used to be. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. You, you, you practice to be proficient. So he said, my aim is to walk in love, notice what it says, with every believer. Amen. We, we want to walk in love with every believer because we want to continue to be a church that represents and, and looks like our community and our city. Meaning we want all ethnicities, we want all races, we want white folk, black folk, Hispanic folk, Asian folk. We want every color, we want every race. Why? Because that's loving every believer. Amen. Do you see that? In uh, Romans 5 and 5, he says, And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Two very important words, of and by. The love of God 
preposition of denoting origin, all right, where something came from. This is not just love, this is God's love. The love of God, which is shed abroad in our hearts by, all right, another word denoting the agent, the way something came into your heart. So at the time that you were born again and the Holy Spirit took up residence in your spirit and in your heart, the love of God came with Him. And it says in the Greek that it flooded your heart. And the Woosh Bible says, and it still floods them. Meaning that I have an endless supply of the love of God. Why? Because it's a never-ending fountain. Amen. So, this is the love of God. This is agape. And that's what's been poured into our heart. Now, there are obviously human, natural loves. Uh, and we won't, I won't spend a lot of time focusing on them. But uh, the Greek word phileo, uh, which means platonic love. The love that you would have between a friend, a best friend, or some, a good friend, somebody like that. Uh, storge, which is familial love, uh, the love that you have for a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, a cousin. It's a familial love. And then, of course, eros, which is uh, romantic or sexual love. But the point is, all of those love have limits. They can grow thin. I don't care how much you love your best friend. That love you have for him, if it's not rooted in the love of God, will grow thin. He will do something that can turn you. No matter, right? L listen, everybody has that family member that just gets on your last one. Everybody's got that cousin. <laughs> right? Amen. Amen. Everybody's got that person that they say, well, we can only have him over for about 30 minutes, and then it just starts going downhill from there. Well, now, now here's why. Well, you love him, he's your family. You love her, she's your family. But this, those love have limits. They can grow thin. They can wear out. Amen. But the agape love of God just gets stronger and stronger the more you put it into operation. The more you put God's love into operation and into motion, it just gets stronger. Amen. Amen. Because it's patient, it's kind, it's long-suffering. Yes. Amen. Isn't that what the Bible says about love? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. Love, right? No matter how the recipient resists it, agape just gets stronger and you're loving this person and showing them love, and they might be even resisting it, but the love of God just gets stronger on the inside of you. Amen. Why? Because that's how the love of God does. We said in uh, uh, the other message that the love of God has gotten greater in your life since you were born again. It says, For if when we were dead in trespasses and sin, Romans 5, 6 through 8, if when we were dead in trespasses and sin, God sent Jesus... To, to, to save us and to reconcile us to Himself, it says, how much more after we're born again will He forgive us when we ask Him? Why, the love of God just got stronger. And when you got born again, that love was so strong that it radically transformed you. One moment you were not born again, you were lost, you were not reconciled to God. The Bible says you were an enemy of God. And the next moment you confess Jesus as Lord and received Him into your life and the love of God immediately made you a new creature. You were no longer an enemy of, of God. You were reconciled to God and a member of the family of God in right standing. And God loved you just as much as He loves Jesus. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, Amen? That's how strong it was. But it's even stronger now. Not because He loves me more, but because I am operating in more of it. Amen. Whoo, glory. Thank you, Lord. Notice 1 Corinthians 12. Oh, thank you, Lord. 1 Corinthians 12. 
and verse 31. I'd rather preach and eat when I'm hungry. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 31. He says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show unto you a more excellent way. The Amplified Bible says, Earnestly desire and zealously cultivate the greatest and best gifts and graces, the higher gifts and the choicest graces, and yet I will show you a still more excellent way, one that is better by far and the highest of them all, love. The voice translation says, Pursue the greater gifts, and let me tell you of a more excellent way, love. So Paul says the greatest thing we can do as believers is walk in agape. That's the more excellent way. So he's, he's saying that love is more excellent than prophesying, the gift of special faith, tongues and interpretation of tongues. He's saying that you can lay hands on someone and have the working of miracles operate in your life and some dramatic thing happen, and he's saying walking in love is still better than that. It's the more excellent way. See, that's what produces the power in a church, is love. Yeah, but if we could all operate in faith, we'll only operate in faith as a body as we operate in love as a body. Because Galatians 5, 6 says that faith works by love. Faith is energized. Faith operates by love. The Woos Bible says faith comes to its full expression through love. The, the, the Corinthian church had power gifts in manifestation. I mean, they had so much tongues and interpretation. They had so much prophecy that Paul had to say, Look, guys, I need to give you some guidelines here. Right? But they were also the church that Paul had to remind to walk in love. Because he said, if you, as a church body, if you do all these wonderful things and you're not walking in love, you're just a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. It's, it's, it, there's, there's no sweetness about it. Amen. He says this is a more excellent way. Love is the power force behind all the gifts. I should desire the best gifts so I can edify the body. That's what the gifts are for, is for the body to be edified, not for the person to be promoted. That's why the Bible says He divides severally to each man as He wills, as the Holy Spirit wills. So anybody in this room could prophesy. Anybody could operate in the work in miracles or the gifts of healing. Now we're talking about those gifts, not specific anointings, not the anointing of the prophet or something of that nature. But anybody could operate in that as the Spirit wills. But what will keep it operating in your life is love. Amen. You'll have more opportunities to operate in those gifts when you walk in love. Why? Because love is the driving force. Love is what caused God to place those gifts in the church by the Holy Spirit for the operation in the church. Oh, glory. Love is what causes the ministry gifts to be effective. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. The, the, the whole driving force behind those five ministry gifts being in the body is the love of God for His people. God loved you enough to give you a pastor. And then He placed His love in your pastor to love you with it. Amen. 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 Do, do, do you see that? that, that that's, that's what produces victory in the lives of people. Amen. Amen. But without love, those ministry gifts are just noise. Just noise. Amen. And people will say, well, you know how, I've had people ask me over the years, how, how can you make sure you keep yourself right in ministry? Walk in love. Walk in love. Love people. Everything that we do as a church and as a ministry gift 
is for the people. If you ever lose sight of the people, you miss the whole point of being in the ministry. That, that, that's what it's all about, is that the people have their needs met. Hallelujah. But yet he said, love was the more excellent way. So if all anybody ever said about you was that you walked in love, they have said the best thing they could ever say. Amen. Glory to God. That's so important. So Paul states that's the greatest thing we can do. Now notice 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Am I helping you tonight? Now I'm going to say again. I'm not saying that you're not doing these things. I'm saying the Bible says that we all have to do this. Amen. Because love very often is preached as a challenge. Oh, we're going to preach on love, and you can hear people go, oh, 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 oh. Well, I mean, it, it, it can be that way, but not if you're constantly determined to walk in your nature. Do you know living above sin is easy when you live in your nature? Right? I grew up classic Pentecostal, and I'm, I'm grateful for my heritage. I really am. But, but I still saw some errors there. And I can't tell you how many times I, I grew up hearing, it's a hard old way. Living for the Lord, oh, it's a hard way. But I'd rather live for Jesus. <laughs> Having a hard old way. And enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You've, I, and I can tell by the laughter, you've heard that or something similar. And then one day, after Pastor Michelle and I were married early on, I ran across the scripture that said, The way of the transgressor is hard, but the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter. Yes. Amen. Yes, and it hit me all of a sudden. It's not a hard to serve God. It's, it's, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The, the easiest time we've ever had is living for God. But I've, I've got to understand that it's, it's my nature to live that way. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13, 5, notice what it says. Speaking of love, it says, Love does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Now, the last time we were together, we talked about... Um, not easily provoked. But tonight we want to look at this for the next few minutes on thinketh no evil. Love thinks no evil. The word thinketh comes from a Greek word that we're told it was an accounting term that could be translated to count or reckon. And it literally means to credit to someone's account. To credit to someone's account. And it's the image of a bookkeeper who keeps very meticulous records, very accurate records, all right? But in the case, in this case, the bookkeeper is an offended person who has kept a detailed record of every wrong that's ever been done to them. Amen. Amen. Now, there are people you know and I know, they can tell you when the person did it. They can tell you the day they did it, what the weather was like, what they were wearing, and what they had for lunch. Because it's so real in their, in their mind. Now, first of all, I want to say this. I'm not saying that people haven't done you wrong and other people wrong. I, I understand that. And what they did wasn't right. But here's the thing. Scripture says love thinks no evil. Right? Now remember again, I'm not saying you got to do this. I'm saying Scripture says we all have to do it. Because Jesus said the commandment was to love one another. So 
1 Corinthians 13 then is how to walk out that commandment. Because if I'm going to love you like I should, there's going to be times i got to forgive you. And forgive you and not think about it anymore. Right? Amen. Forgive you and put the record book away. Why? Because I have forgiven. I've had people say this. Well, I forgave, but I'm not going to forget. Forgiving is forgetting. If you forgive, you forget. Why? Because the Bible says that's what God did for us. That He forgave us and forgot what we did. And it says that that's how I'm supposed to love. Now, people will say, well, you know, what they did to me was very hard. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to grow into this. But you can start. You can start. Well, how can you start? Lord, I forgive them. I forgive them right now. Amen. Right? Listen, just moments before, remember Jesus, it says he was crucified with two thieves. And in one of the gospel accounts, it says both of those thieves were railing on Jesus. Both of them. Then in another account, it talks about the one railing on Jesus and the other one saying, look, quit that. We deserve to be here. He doesn't deserve to be here. But just moments before, both of them were railing on Jesus. And just moments after that statement, that man hanging beside Jesus said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. On the cross, Jesus forgave the man that just moments before was insulting him and making fun of him and railing on him. And then the man had a change of heart and said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said, done. Today. Even on the cross, he forgot and forgave. And that thief is in heaven today. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Because Jesus forgave and threw the record away. Mm. Do you see that? Now this is so important. Because this person that we see here has kept a detailed record. Of every hurt, every mistake, every fault, every disappointment. Every perceived wrongdoing that anyone's made against them. Now, understand what I mean by this. I don't mean that you won't have a memory of it. I mean that it won't produce in you the same effect. I know they did me wrong, but I don't care. Right? Try, try that out. Say it out loud. I know they did me wrong. But I don't care. <laughs> See, that's why I tell you, you got to have an IDC degree. I don't care. I don't care. I, I know they did me wrong, but I don't care. Why? Because I don't have a record of it. Hallelujah. Instead of forgiving and letting those things go, they have carefully maintained records of each action done to them that they thought was unjust or unfair. Now again, I'm going to repeat myself. I'm not saying that there's anybody in here that that I'm not telling you, you have to do this. I'm telling you, Scripture says we have to do it. Amen. I was was preaching one time and I was was sharing along these lines. And, you know, as a pastor, and please don't misunderstand me. uh, You love people. But if, you know, one, one time, anybody know who Roy Acuff was? Okay, Grand Ole Opry star. And uh, somebody came up to him one time. They was taking a picture with him. And they looked at Roy and they said, Roy, don't you wish you had a, a dollar for every picture that somebody's ever taken with you? And old Roy looked back at him and said, I do, son. I do. So, you know, they thought it'd be nice you'd be rich. And Roy was saying, I am rich. I do have a dollar. 
Well, anyway, my point is, if, if I could count the number of times that people, and, and people mean well, they mean well. They come up and they promise something. This is what I'm going to do. The Lord told me to do this. God told me, and, or whatever. I was praying and the Lord spoke to me. And, and then it slips their mind or they just don't do it. Man, when, when that person used to walk in the back door or the side door or wherever they walked in through, climbed in the window or however they got in there, and I would see them, the first thing I would think about was, they're a liar. Because they said they would do this and they didn't do it. Now, you know, there's a case to be made for that. You shouldn't say something you're not going to do. But, right? But here's where the onus comes back on. I got to quit seeing it that way. That doesn't mean I trust them. Or even believe them when they say something else. It means I, I am not keeping a record of the last time. They didn't do what they said. Why? That keeps me open to help them. That keeps the door open for me to minister to them. Because you never know when they're going to change. You got to keep the door open because you never know when things are going to turn. Amen. I say amen. The Lord helped me with that, that with my kids a long time ago. Not, not the badroom about how they, they did or what they're doing. He said, because you could close the only door they'll ever walk back through. Yeah, but they're not doing right. I understand they're not doing right, but don't let it become a hurt. Don't let it become a, a pain in your life. you got to keep the door open. Amen? Because that's not how agape operates. Look at Colossians 2. We'll look at how agape operates. Thank you, Jesus. Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. Familiar scriptures, but notice this. It's as in you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you, notice this phrase, all trespasses. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against you, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The God's Word translation says you were once dead because of your failures and your uncircumcised corrupt nature, but God made you alive with Christ when he forgave all your failures. All of them. And he did this by erasing the charges that were brought against us by the written laws God had established. He took the charges away by nailing them to the cross. The Good News translation says, You were at one time spiritually dead because of your sins and because you were Gentiles without the law. But God has now brought you to life with Christ. God forgave us all our sins. He canceled the unfavorable record of your debts with its binding rules and did away with it completely nailing it to the cross that's agape forgave all your sins canceled the unfavorable record of your debt and did away with it completely that's agape did away with it completely forgave them all Canceled the debt and did away with it. Amen. You may remember the song. When I was a boy growing up in church, we sang a song that said, uh, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. Right? That was true. I couldn't, there's no way I could pay the debt I owed. He didn't just pay it, he canceled it. He did away with it. It doesn't exist. There is no record of who you used to be. None. I, I'm, I mean, the FBI, the CIA, no matter how deep they go back and try to correct your past and hide it, they, they don't hold a candle to God. 
Because He didn't just erase your past failures and clean you up. He erased them through making you a brand new creature in Christ. He so loved you that He remade you in His image. And in the mind of God, you're a species of being that never existed before. Never existed. Your birthday, 19 whatever it was, is not the day the real you came into existence. That's when that flesh, uh, that, that, that shell of dying flesh came into the earth. But there was a day, whenever that day was, amen, when you gave your heart to Jesus and you were truly born again, the debt against you was canceled, all your sins were forgiven, and the record was done away with. Woo! That's how agape operates. Amen? That's why Ephesians 4.31 talks about forgiving, being that word charis, no strings attached. You do away with the record, it's done. I don't remember it. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the agape love of God canceled the record that was against us. Amen. Do you see that? People will say, well, well, you know, the devil brings up our past to God. No, he doesn't. The devil brings up your past to you, but he doesn't bring up your past to God because to God you have no past. Satan has no access to the throne. He's been cast down to the earth. People talk about the courtroom in heaven and two sides arguing. There's no two sides arguing in heaven. The devil's not in heaven. He doesn't have access to heaven. The devil is the accuser of the brethren to the brethren. He, he accuses you to each other. He accuses you to you. God, in His agape love, so loved you and forgave you, you have no past. And the Bible says very plainly that, 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 that God who forgave you, Jesus who died for you, he said, he said, who then can be against you if God's for you then tell me, who can be against you? Whew. I like that because in the Greek, it's like Paul's holding up a list of everybody that could possibly be against them. And he's saying, but listen, look at the list, and then let me ask you a question. If God is for you, who? That's how it ends in the Greek. Who? Who can possibly be against you? The answer is nobody, because God is for me. Amen. Why is God for me? God is for me not because He feels sorry for me. God is for me because He forgave me, and I'm a brand new creature in Christ without a past, one that doesn't exist, and God is 100% on my side. Whoo! Glory to God. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Paul said, Paul said, who are you to condemn me? It's Christ that died for me. Yea, rather is risen again. It's God that forgave me. See, that'll help you walk in love. I don't know why you don't like me, but God forgave me. Jesus died for me, so I love you. <laughs> Amen. Look at Isaiah 43 and 25. We're almost done. Whew. That's where you go, oh, uh, I'm joking. Amen. You don't have to do that. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but I get to talking about how much God loves me, and I get fired up. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Isaiah uh, 43 and verse 25. I, even I am he that blotteth out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Notice that phrase, I will not. The message translation says, but yes, but I, yes, I am the one who takes care of your sins. That's what I do. I don't keep a list of your sins. <laughs> and he says, I will not. 
There's, there's an act of God's will there. I choose not to remember your sin. That's how agape behaves. Why? Because God is perfect. God never forgets anything in the sense that we think about forgetfulness. He chooses to forget. Because perfection cannot forget. If you're forgetful, you're not perfect. God doesn't forget anything. He is perfect in all of His ways. But He can choose to forget. And when He chooses to forget, it never enters His mind. And He says, I won't remember them. I will not. I blot them out and I won't remember them. Whoo, that's agape. Amen? So that, am I making sense? So the enemy will come and try to, number one, bring your own failures up to you. But the agape love of God is there saying, I won't remember them against you. There's nothing to remember. When you go to God and, and you might bring it up, God's like, what are you talking about? It is in bad taste to bring up to God what He's forgiven you of. Because He's forgiven it and He doesn't remember it. Oh, glory. So he doesn't say this, God will never, say this, God will never choose to remember my failures. And see, we're loving with that kind of love. We're loving with that kind of nature. So that means I choose not to remember your failures. But how do I have to do it? I have to choose. And you got to tell yourself, I will not remember that. So God doesn't keep a record of our past forgiven sins once they're under the blood of Jesus. This is so important. God separates them from us forever. You are separated from your past forever. Amen. Amen. That's how agape behaves. If you're ever tempted to keep a mental record of wrongs that someone's done to you, be aware you're not giving that person the same mercy God gave you. One, one time, and, and you know, I, I can only tell on myself, I can't tell on you, I don't know nothing on you. <laughs> Yet. Uh, <clears throat> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. But, well, Vernon, I know a lot on Vernon, but... But man, there, there, there was a guy coming to the church and uh, he just kept messing up. And I mean, he was doing things that was hurting his wife and, and hurting his marriage and hurting his relationship. And, and you know, he, he would kind of get things right and then he would come back. And, and, uh, and one day something had happened again and I just got mad. I'm just, I'm not going to pray for him. I'm just, you know, I'm done. The Holy Ghost didn't say that. I, Holy Philip said that. <laughs> ah. and boy the Lord said to me and you know the Lord has never you know been ugly to me but he was very stern but yet loving he said so you're mad at him for doing the same thing I forgave you of what do you say well you're kind of in a, in a corner I had to say well that's right Amen. Do you see that? When, 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 when I keep a record, I'm not giving that person the same mercy God gave me. And make no mistake, Scripture says, if you want mercy, you've got to show mercy. It's, it's what we call the shadow of a doubt. I've told people before, the way around that is just, you know, maybe they didn't know what they're doing. I know good and well they knew what they were doing. Okay, I, un I understand that, but love says maybe they didn't. Right? Well, they knew when they called me that ugly name. They knew what they were doing. Maybe it slipped. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> Amen. 
And, uh, you know, people say, well, they gave, made an ugly gesture at me. They were telling you you were number one. That's what it was. Now, we know, but here's the point. Mercy. Right? Let me finish. I got one more comment for you. Someone who's been forgiven as much as we've been forgiven has no right to keep a record of someone else's mistakes. Because no matter what time you were saved, no matter what age you were saved, I know I have a minister friend that was born again at three years of age. He remembers being born again at three years of age. Bobby Indian, many of you know him. Born again at three years of age. Now, I don't know what kind of sins you could commit between one and two. But here, here's what I know. <laughs> the, the, big, the bigness of the sin was not what was done. It was the condition of the person. The moment we were born into this earth, we were born sinners. We were born separated from God. We were born with an impassable gulf. I, I couldn't save myself. So there is, I was forgiven of something impossible from the very beginning. So if God loved me and did the impossible for me, then I can forgive you of whatever you've done. And, and remember something, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of this that I said before. Whether the person accepts your forgiveness or not is irrelevant. They may or they may not. But you have forgiven, so you're right. That's so important. But I'm glad God forgave me of what He forgave me of. And every, every time I'm tempted to not walk in love with somebody, I remind myself what God forgave me of. Because remember what Scripture says? Jesus says, to whom much is forgiven, much is required. Meaning, if you've been forgiven much, you have to forgive much. Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you tonight. We're just so grateful that you have forgiven us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace in our life. And Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you would help us to show that to others. And as we show that to others and we become those people that walk in love at this agape level, that we'll see the power of God in manifestation in our church as we've never seen it before. And Father, we'll give you the praise for it and the glory for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll stand up, everybody. Good to see everybody on a Wednesday night. You're such a strong church. Such a handsome church. Beautiful church. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. And, of course, now Sunday morning we'll be ministering as well, and uh, the Word of God will be going forth. Wonderful things going on. We got a good Christmas choir line up for you Sunday. I think six songs. Is that right? Six songs, praise God. So uh, we'll be hearing angels on high, amen, hallelujah. And uh, uh, we'll be ministering uh, along the lines of uh, our Savior. Uh, of course, I'm, and, and uh, of course, Wednesday is, is Christmas, and so we want to talk about what the birth of Jesus literally means. And uh, we want to be ministering along those lines, and Sunday night we'll be ministering as well, amen. So God's so good. Look at your neighbor before we say our vision. Say, I'm sure glad you came to church tonight. Amen. Come on, say it with me tonight, would you? The vision of this church is to build people's faith and frame their world by the Word of God. And you and I will always be world changers. God bless you.